because now we're indefinitely detaining anyone the United States considers a traitor. We're not giving them a trial. The treason clause requires either confession in open court or two witnesses to the same overt act. We assassinated two American citizens without a charge and without a trial and called them traitors and accused them of treason. The NDAA takes that and now applies it to American soil and all American citizens anywhere in the world. First Amendment, free speech. Let's say I'm on the suspected terrorist watch list. I probably already am. But, but let, let's say I'm on there. And you're a journalist and you hang out with me for a day. Knowing you can be indefinitely detained for substantially supporting associated forces of terrorism, when you write an article about hanging out with me, are you more likely to write a positive article or a negative one? Negative one. It chills free speech. The second one, right to bear arms. Several of these documents talking about suspected terrorists refer to people who have multiple guns and refer to people who have weatherproof ammunition as an instant indicator of terrorism. It chills the Second Amendment. Fourth Amendment, to be secure in your persons and papers. Obviously, if you're being indefinitely detained without a charge in a trial, you're not secure in your persons and papers. Fifth Amendment of due process. Sixth Amendment of speedy trial. Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. This is interesting. Because... Under the NDAA, not only can they indefinitely detain you, they can take you to any foreign country, externally rendite you, take you to any foreign country and leave you there. And not bring you home. Or torture you. Doesn't matter. They can take you to a foreign country. It violates cruel and unusual punishment. However, even though the NDAA directly violates at least six amendments of the Bill of Rights, that is not the most dangerous part of this law. That's why we call it the most dangerous law since the United States Civil War. The most dangerous part of the NDA is hidden in that requirement to detain. Let's look at it again and highlight a different part. The armed forces of the United States shall hold a person described in paragraph 2 who is captured under the course of hostilities authorized by the AUMF in military custody pending disposition under the law of war. Notice it does not say pending disposition under the Constitution. Pending disposition under the law of war. What is the law of war? The law of war has been enacted twice in the United States before. Once, in 1862, Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the Civil War. Not only did he suspend habeas corpus, but in that same order, he said, anyone disloyal to the government will be put under military jurisdiction. We detained 15,000 northerners during the Civil War. The second time was in February 1942. Executive Order 9066, signed by President Roosevelt, where they've been executed. That's what the law of war does. Does the NDA undermine your constitutional rights under the law of war? Now, going back and stepping back a little bit, what other countries have enacted the law of war on their own soil? Anyone guess? Russia. Soviet Russia. China. Iran. Cuba. Cuba. Venezuela. Yes, Venezuela. North Korea. Syria. Egypt. Somalia. North Vietnam. Not exactly countries we want to become. They all enacted the law of war on their own soil. Now, a history of the law of war. The law of war was first put together the Geneva Conventions. It's called International Laws of War. It essentially governs what countries can and cannot do during wartime. When they originally put it together, they put two categories. One, combatants. The other, non-combatants. Combatants, you hold a weapon, you're going to shoot people, and non-combatants, you don't, you're a civilian. However, after 9-11, the United States said, well, that's kind of useless to us, because we can't torture under the law of war. It's prohibited. And so the Bush Justice Department created, out of thin air, the new category called unlawful enemy combatants, under which all of the punishments of the law of war apply, but none of the protections do. And we tortured the 9-11 hijackers under this. This same category was then brought to the Council on Foreign Relations, not exactly a friendly group to liberty. They debated it in 2009 and decided that, you know, that's a little too restrictive because it only allows to take from combatant side. 
we're going to take non-combatants as well under this. <coughs> and so they renamed the category unprivileged enemy belligerent. Which, number one, implies that your rights are a privilege. And number two, they use that as their excuse to assassinate the two American citizens they talked about in Yemen. Why do you think they use the term belligerent act in the NDAA? Because American citizens have now been put under a category that the United States created to torture and use to execute. That is the category they view all of us in. In fact, Senator Lindsey Graham was on the United States Senate floor saying the world is the battlefield, including the homeland. And he said, if you even think, and I'm quoting, if you think about supporting Al-Qaeda, you have three things coming your way. Death, detention, prosecution. Think. So thought is now a crime. The law of war on American soil. There are no constitutional rights under the law of war. There are no constitutional protections under the law of war. It is the single most dangerous law to be enacted on a soil. We saw it in Watertown. In Watertown, using the calling pressure cookers a weapon of mass destruction, which used to be nuclear, biological, and chemical, but now they're calling pressure cookers a weapon of mass destruction, using that excuse, 9,000 law enforcement assisted the military. Not the other way around. 9,000 law enforcement assisted the military, locked down Watertown, Massachusetts. Hand of Massachusetts was going to meet in Watertown that day. That's how close. I flew out of Boston. I'd just done a speech, several speeches down there for my team. I flew out of Boston five hours before the bombs went off. In Watertown, Massachusetts, they locked down an entire city and went door to door to door, pulling people out of their homes, dragging them on the street. They took people and dropped them off in different cities in the middle of nowhere because they were in the way. They took reporters, slammed them on the ground, searched them, on and on and on. This is when the law of war is applied to an American city. They did it again, or they did it before that in Big Bear Lake, California. Does anyone remember the Christopher Dorner when he was running around LA? Christopher Dorner supposedly released a manifesto online and killed several officers. Well, when he was running around, Big Bear Lake, California, a town of 3,000 people was put under the law of war, and the exact same thing that happened in Watertown happened in Big Bear Lake. The law of war is the single most dangerous thing to be enacted on American soil. And yet, we lead the nation in how many times we've done it. Now we're at three. The Constitution is once, was once the supreme law of the land, and now it has essentially been replaced with the law of war. So if you are detained by the military and brought in, they can go and flip a coin and give you your constitutional rights and a trial on heads and on tails, detain you indefinitely or execute you under the law of war. That's how dangerous this is. So I got in this fight because I realized that America has to draw on the line in the sand somewhere. Where? If not at indefinite detention and possible execution, where do we draw that line? You know, I told you I never wanted to get involved in politics. I didn't. The Founding Fathers never wanted to engage in the American Revolution. And I never thought I would work. I come from a more right side of the spectrum. I never thought I would end up working with half my state team leaders being members of Occupy. <laughs> I never thought that. But this is an issue where if we don't stand up and take on this issue, within five years of enacting the law of war, every single country brought tyranny to their country. Within five years. The NDAA has been in effect for a year and a half. If we don't stand up here, then when? If we don't stand up now, then when? You know, constitutional lawyer Chris Ann Hall I had the opportunity, it was, it was really great, I had the opportunity to speak at the Constitutional Sheriff's Convention in Missouri. And Constitutional Lawyer Chris Ann Hall went up there and said, here's a picture of my son. She flies around the country speaking for free at events all across the country. Here's a picture of my son. I know I sacrifice. In order to preserve liberty, we must sacrifice. But if we don't sacrifice today, our children will pay for it with their blood. It's a sobering thought. It's not a thought anybody in the United States should ever have to think about. But it's what we're facing right now. 
The cycle of the body politic usually lasts 250 years. 250 to 300 years is the life cycle of a country. How long a country is allowed to remain, how long a country can sustain itself. America's 250th year will be 2026. We're facing on a red line. We're, fa we're coming up to a line. There are many other issues. There are NSA spying. There, there, there are uh, all, uh, the drug war. There are all kinds of issues all across the spectrum that are so dangerous and hurting this country deeply from the inside. But if we don't draw a line at the military coming to our house and indefinitely detaining ourselves or our family, where else do we draw that line? How much more can we compromise? How many more years can America compromise until my generation and the next generation has to see men in the military walking down their street like the secret police did in East Germany? How many times are we going to compromise as a country? I got into this because... I want to look at the next generation one day. I want to look at someone who's three, four, five years old, maybe six years old, who has not lost their innocence yet. I want to look at them and I want to tell them, you're free. I want to mean it. I can't do that today. I can't sit down and watch my country fall apart. Over a million men and women gave their lives and shed their blood on foreign soil for the freedoms and liberties we used to enjoy in this country. At my Coos County presentation a couple days ago, I had a, a young lady named Mary Jedry come up. She talked about how her son was permanently disabled in the war and came back. She talked about the unknown soldier and what's written on the tomb of the unknown soldier. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, I'm paraphrasing here, but it says, if a soldier were to come back today, if that unknown soldier who fought for our freedoms and fought for our liberties were to come back today, would he ask why? Would he ask why? I don't come here to scare you. I don't come here to, to put the fear in anyone. I come here because I want to see a place that I can live. I want to see a place where my generation can live. I want to see a place where the next generation can live. And right now, America is not that place. It's not that place. Yeah. And so. Right. And so we're fighting back. And so we're saying, Panda has drawn the line and say enough. Oath Keepers has drawn a line in the sand and say enough. Anti-war has drawn a line in the sand and say enough. Over, I can name our partners across the country. I've drawn a line in the sand and say enough. We will not compromise on this. We will not compromise on this last basic pillar of our liberty. And today, I'll have Shane come up next. He'll be talking, or Colin will come up next to talk a little bit about Oregon, a little bit about Oregon Constitution, a little bit about the way we fight back. This is the issue. This is the issue that unites the left and right. This is the issue that brings people together because we, if we do not have our liberty, we have nothing else. This is that issue. There will be sign-up forms over there if you want to join Panda. Shane is our Oregon state team leader, been leading the state, uh, been very, very successful. He drug me out of bed at 3.30 in the morning a couple days ago and crazy, he doesn't need sleep. Um, there are sign-up forms on that table. If you want to join Panda, you can put your name down there. Uh, we also, as an organization, uh, we've run on $1,500 for a year and a half. I'm kind of impressed by that. Uh, but we are now starting to need money, so we are starting a charter member program. If you want to check the box there and say, I want to be a charter member, I want to help out Panda financially. No, not everybody can. It's fine. And you can also donate to help, uh, help me go around the country and, and keep doing this and, and help us rent the rooms and things like that uh, to, to both Oath Keepers and Panda in that, uh, in that bucket there. Uh, thank you guys all for bringing me here to speak, and I, and I want you to, I want to leave you with this, so I want to remember one thing. After the Constitutional Convention came up, and uh, they shuttered the doors, they, they locked the windows, and, and uh, then uh, it's, it's all over, and, and Ben Franklin walks out of the convention. And he walks out, and a young lady, she, she gets up from the bench, and she approaches him, and she says, well, what kind of government have you given us? A monarchy? And Ben Franklin looks her in the eye, and he says, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it.
America is only a republic if we can keep it. Thank you for letting me speak in front of you today.